about to begin. Again, please take your seats. Our program is about to begin. It's been a cold day since the first time You were a lonely child You were a friend of mine Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Veronica Combs, editor in chief, Med City Media. Good morning. Welcome to Bethesda. Welcome to Engage. Thank you so much for joining us to talk about patient engagement. I think we got off to a pretty good start last night. If you haven't seen Code Black, the movie, um, uh, you should. It's going to be showing around the country through the end of the year. Um, I'm glad that I have health insurance and I'm glad that I don't have to rely on a county hospital, although the doctors who work there are obviously amazing and and if I needed it, I would be glad to go there. So um, the movie was actually made by a physician and um, the physicians in the audience last night said it was a very true portrayal of life working in the ER. And I always say what's so great about my job is that I get to talk to smart people doing really important work. Um, patient engagement is, is a real interest of mine and um, over the last few months I've talked to people doing really amazing work. Um, a nurse in Ohio is working with a hospice company to do pharmacogenetic testing um, to make sure that pain medications actually work for hospice patients. I, I talked to a woman last week who wants to marry um, patient reviews of hospital experiences and quality data so that you have sort of the subjective and the objective report on it on a facility. Um, there's a Philadelphia company putting diabetes coaching in the grocery. Um, uh, there, there are people building apps that are meant to be only used short term in that initial window when you just got diagnosed with something horrible and you're trying to figure out what to do. So um, I think what I've learned from all of this is, is uh, encapsulated in an article I read about Breast Cancer Awareness Month. 
Um, I find the wave of pink stuff to buy kind of annoying, and I, I don't really think it helps much to prevent uh, breast cancer or help patients. But this project was interesting. A tattoo parlor had a day where women with mastectomy scars could come in and get a tattoo. And my first thought was, oh, ow, that would hurt. But I thought, well, you know, if that helps someone in their recovery, then I'm glad to know I could get a tattoo if I needed one. So that sort of illustrates that if patient engagement makes you kind of think, Ugh, we couldn't do that, or that would never work, or workflow, or privacy, or whatever, um, I would encourage you to push through that initial cringe and, and think about it, because that probably means you're on the right track. And you're probably thinking about a problem that other people haven't addressed. So if you hear an idea today and your first response is, that would never work, push through and, and consider it and see if you could find a way to make it work. So before I introduce our first speaker, I have a few housekeeping notes. Um, our, if you're not on Twitter, you should be. Our uh, hashtag is MCEngage, not MCEngage, but MedCityEngage. So tweet out all your thoughts. Um, if you would like to give your own review of the conference, uh, we have, we're working with a partner in our innovation showcase. You can text, and this number will be around, um, you can text your comments to 202-759-3888. So that's a chance for real-time feedback on what we're doing up here. Um, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, and I will start with our gold level sponsors, and I won't forget anyone, not to worry, if you're not in the gold list. Um, Kaiser Permanente, uh, Sherwick, uh, AARP is sponsoring us today, and so is Verizon. If you enjoy lunch, then you can thank Verizon because they're they paid for that. Um, so I get to go around the country and 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 attend lots of really interesting events. Uh, I have a great job, thank you, Chris. Um, and in March, I was moderating a panel at a Boomer Summit in San Diego, and I wanted to make time to speak with the folks at West. Um, West Health Institute, and I always get their name wrong because you guys change it. Um, uh, I wanted to meet them um, because they're doing such interesting work around interoperability and price transparency, and um, I met Dr. Smith, and uh, we had a great lunch and talked about all these great ideas, and I really wanted him to come and share their work with you. So Dr. Smith is not only a cardiologist, he also has degrees in medical engineering and medical physics, and he has worked for J&J um, &J and Guidant and also practiced as a cardiologist. I'm not sure all of the. I'm not sure how all that fits together, but I think it's really cool that he's trying to help patients find good quality healthcare and in a place that works works together, not not butts heads. So, so please welcome to the stage, um, Dr. Joseph Smith. Hey, thanks. Um, if my voice cracks, it's just because in addition to being a doctor, I'm also a patient. I'm kind of struggling with a little bit of something that I acquired in a plane somewhere, I suspect. So um, thanks. Thanks, Veronica, for having me. Thank you all for showing up. Um, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll tell you that um, engagement, aside from um, watching Star Trek where, you know, the, the, the captain turns to whoever is his number one and says, engage. Or um, when, I, um, when I got married and I got engaged, um, it, it isn't a natural topic for me. I'm a geeky, nerdy engineer, and after that, a geekiest and nerdiest cardiologist. I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist. So for those of you who, who don't know what that is, we typically stay in the basement of hospitals staring at squiggly lines, trying to fix a rhythm problem that most of the referral docs can't even spell right and the patients don't really understand and we typically work on patients only while they're asleep and so engagement isn't something that comes i would say naturally uh to me and so i've had to work on it a bit um I i'll uh i'll i'll say a little bit about my parent organization west health which is really four different organizations, but this is not going to be a long commercial, so don't, don't worry. Um, we're a, a nonprofit um, medical research organization in La Jolla. We're a similarly a nonprofit policy center here in DC. Um, we're also an investment fund where all the proceeds ultimately get turned to run the, the nonprofits, and we base that out of Chicago. And then we're also a small business incubator for people who have good ideas. And it's really all about this one idea, um, 
if I can still have my slides, that would be, yeah, it is, it is all about this one idea of new and smarter technologies, policies, and practices to make high quality healthcare more accessible and more affordable. It really is about lowering the cost of healthcare. And so you might say, gee, cheaper and engagement, how does that work? I'm going to try to get you through that a little bit. So I said I wasn't native to this term engagement and engage, so I had to look it up. Uh, and so it, to me, the uh, this full kind of uh, dictionary definition describes kind of the path that patient engagement has been through. I think initially healthcare and patients lived in a um, an ecosystem that was more characterized by entanglement and entrapment than engagement. You know, we as, pr as practitioners use nomenclature that the average patient cannot understand. You can't even read our handwriting. And so the notion that we engage with you to work together to get something done doesn't really naturally occur. Um, there's certainly a notion of influence and power. I think, uh, I think everyone will agree that the relationship between physicians and patients hasn't yet found uh, the, the, a notion of equanimity. I don't think we've gotten to the point where all parties are viewed the same. I think uh, certainly healthcare now holds your attention, but it, it is more a contest and a battle uh, than perhaps it is a willing engagement. Um, and last, I think we, you know, we, we perhaps need some tools to enter into that uh, engagement and conflict to, to make it more of a, a level playing field. And so where is patient engagement today? I think um, it should, I should start by saying that no one is really more engaged in healthcare than the patient. Couldn't possibly be, right? Because the patient bears the pain, the disease, the weight, the worry, the scar, the complications, and the bill. And so you've really got it all. You're right, you're right smack in the center of it. It's just that you don't yet get the data, the understanding, the price, or even an informed choice. And so those things are not quite yours as, as patients. And it's, it's not, and I, I think we have to be careful not to blame the patient, not to blame the victim in this. I mean, I, I'm worried about patient engagement conferences when we try to amp up patients to essentially tackle the challenges of interfacing with our healthcare system. We, we cannot burden the weakest among us to do the most difficult. That, that would be, I think, unintelligent and, and ill-configured. When we look at patient engagement from the, from the system side, we see, and this is just out in Health Affairs from Ashish Shah. If you don't know Ashish, you should read him. He's really quite good. Only 30% of physicians routinely use secure messaging with patients. Only 24% routinely provide patients with the ability to view online their records and only 14% share data with providers outside their organizations. So when you think about engagement, it's tough to marry that with a rather cloistered notion of information about yourself, your needs, your, your healthcare. When it's, when it's siloed and garnered so carefully, it's difficult to be engaged. And the process of getting healthcare is not particularly inviting. You know, I, I, unfortunately I couldn't make the movie last night, but I will tell you that when we ask patients who are at their worst to engage with our healthcare system, and it looks like this, we can't expect too much. I have a good friend, a doc, uh, Rich Fogros, and he says, you know, think of it this way. If you walk out of a gas station in the middle of the night with a bag of money in one hand and a handgun in the other, drenched in blood, leaving two attendants behind you on the floor, and you're arrested by Maryland's finest, the first thing they do is provide you a court-appointed attorney because they realize that even though you're guilty of sin, confronting you, the legal system is just way too challenging for the, the average individual. And now imagine that it's midnight and you present to the emergency room with abdominal pain. And you're confronting a system which is arguably at least tenfold more complicated and you're ill and you're innocent and yet there is no advocate for you to confront the most complex healthcare system going and at the same time your life is on the line and so are we doing the right thing when we think about aiding in engagement 
When we look at our structures for healthcare delivery, can we ask whether they're built to engage and serve or to impress and overwhelm? Right, so the upper left is Johns Hopkins New Hospital. I was fortunate enough to go uh, and give an address there. And, and I, I think I mentioned that I thought this was an icon to the history of healthcare delivery. And I was, I was not immediately welcome back. Um, the upper right is, uh, is a cancer hospital that the, the Cleveland Clinic has put up. And the one on the lower right, I, I find fascinating, this is, this is an image of a hospital to be built in Tunisia at the price of 50 billion euros, uh, if in fact it can be built. And so these structures, as you look at them, they don't, they don't point to you that this is a welcoming, serving organization. I'm reminded more of the temples of old, like Machu Picchu, where you go and you are inspired but awestruck. Uh, and, you know, you are, you know, left to be on your knees as a supplicant, as opposed to treated as an equal party. I'm a bit reminded of uh, the astronaut as he approaches uh, the monolith in 2001, A Space Odyssey. That's that, that look of, oh my God, what is that? What am I going to do? Isn't that the way we often encounter our healthcare system? Like, what, what's all that? And I don't have any hooks. And how do I get, how do I get involved in this? And what's going to happen to me? And so I don't, I don't think we're building our structures in a way which engages and serves. I think it's more about a healthcare odyssey, perhaps, of uh, us being confronted by the large and kind of inscrutable unknown, which is our healthcare system. I will tell a couple stories. And so the first is um, my, a friend and colleague, uh, Steve, and I won't give more than that because of the requirements of HIPAA and PHI. But I'll say that uh, Steve was working with me when I was when I was uh, practicing at WashU in St. Louis, and he uh, and his wife gave birth to premature triplets. And Steve is a very, very smart cardiologist. And so he said, look, I need to take the next couple of months off and live in the hospital. And so Steve was right because uh, his kids nearly died on a number of occasions. And it was Steve being present in the NICU that saved the life of his kid more than one time. And so that is a success story, but I'll tell you, it was a hard one success because it was an incredibly knowledgeable practitioner at the bedside serving to protect the ill from the well-intended. Um, our, our healthcare system is inherently so complicated and uh, inherently so dangerous that it often requires a, a very knowledgeable steward to manage for the, the ill, to manage for the encumbered, to make sure that their path through it is as positive as possible. I'll tell you another story uh, briefly, and that's uh, Josie King, and she was an 18-month-old who was burned um, in a bathtub by accident. Not terribly burned, but badly enough that she needed care at one of our nation's finest hospitals. And while her mother stayed at the bedside uh, for uh, the better part of a week and a half, uh, on, on one day, she noted that something bad was about to happen and challenged a bedside clinician to say, no, no, you shouldn't do that, uh, and that she wasn't necessarily heard. Uh, the end result was a catastrophe for her child, and so her child passed by virtue of you know, a therapeutic misadventure that was completely preventable, and even her engagement was insufficient in preventing the loss of her child. And so we struggle with finding the right form of engagement in a system which is so complicated. And we struggle, and I mean all of us, we. I mean we also, the practitioners, we also struggle. Because healthcare is wildly complicated. There are 140,000 diagnostic codes. There are at least 21,000 different names for medicines, and that's not counting all of the generic names. There are at least 50,000 different medical devices. Each drug has on average 70 different potential adverse events and some have hundreds of potential adverse events and none of them are given in isolation. The average Medicare Part D patient takes on average 49 different prescriptions in the course of a year. Um, in, in 2010, there were 25,400 journals to be read and consumed. Um, and as we look at that going forward, there are 500,000 new records added to PubMed every year. If you tried to keep up with all of that, it would obviously be impossible. So let's just say that all you're going to do is read the, the relatively 
kind of straightforward established guidelines. Just you as a doc are gonna give up your ability to know about the latest and greatest and are just going to study the pre-digested kind of preordained thinking of the, the various professional medical societies. You'd find only 2,500 of those disease specific guidelines and as they are updated typically every two to three years as something you'd have to keep up with. The Institute of Medicine uh, took a look and said, okay, so for the average practitioner who sees patients in an eight-hour day, if in fact all they did was apply guidelines-based care, nothing novel, nothing new, not reading the journal from last week or last month, but just did guidelines-based care, how long would it take them to go through the process of ticking off what the patient has against the guidelines and making sure they get what they need? And their best estimate was that it takes 21.7 hours in a day to see eight hours worth of patients. So it can't be a surprise that we're not getting this done. It exceeds the bandwidth of the people who were charted with doing it. And so as we all have our frustrations about the healthcare system, start to imagine that it's really just bigger than we are. It can't be packed into the brains of even the brightest among us to get all of this done. You know, I don't know if any of you are fans of uh, Jeopardy, but there was a day when Kent Jennings, the world's best Jeopardy player, had to play against IBM's best computer. And at the end, he held up his little double Jeopardy, final Jeopardy sign and said, I welcome my computer overlord because Ken Jennings wasn't able to play Jeopardy as well as Big Blue. And I would, I would hazard to guess that it's no stretch to imagine that at some point in the near future, we'll all recognize that each of us playing a game of Jeopardy with our lives, with your lives, we also will have to kneel to our computer overlords at some point to help us manage some of the information that's simply moving too fast. And so when it's no then no big surprise then when you ask practitioners today, internal medicine docs, family practitioners, about their happiness in their jobs and find that upwards of 40% would leave medicine today if they had a viable alternative. So as, as we think about engagement and we think about doing, doing battle to make sure we're fully engaged, realize that the folks on the other side of the exam table also feel a sense of overwhelming under empowerment, that the, the field is escaping them, that it's gone beyond their ability to bring it all in and discharge it in a way that makes sense. Those things which routinely make us happy, you know, autonomy and mastery, I think your average physician is losing sight of those. Autonomy from a healthcare system that is asking for more and more paperwork in the absence of understandable value, and at the same time, an accelerating growth in the rate of new information um, and the new complexities of patient care such that mastery is no longer possible. And so um, it's, I would love to tell you that it's getting better real soon, <clears throat> but I can't. Um, the largest task before U.S. healthcare is going to be the sustainable management of chronic disease. Currently, we spend 75% of every dollar, 96% of every Medicare dollar on the management of chronic disease. And we have an aging population. And so if, if you wonder, as you age, you do accumulate those chronic diseases. And so that which is challenging now will be more challenging going forward. And, and our population just isn't aging a little bit. You know, we're getting 10,000 people hitting age 65 every day, and I think are estimated to do so for the next 18 years. And so kind of uh, hold on, because it's, it's only going to get more complex. And then we have, and I put in quotes, a relative physician shortage. Compared to other countries, we're perhaps not so short, but compared to our history and the way we deliver healthcare, uh, when, when one normalizes by the number of folks, the number of diagnoses, the number of visits, the number of operations, we are going to be well understaffed going, going forward. And then, and then an, an obvious complexity is that chronic disease isn't the same thing six weeks later. 
right? If, if any of you have a chronic disease of any kind, you realize that it waxes and wanes. And so the notion that you'll be prescribed the medicine in January and um, you'll be on a static dose of that until you next see a doctor in March or in May, that, that makes as little sense as putting gas in your car once and driving it just continuously. Um, it changes. Everything changes. And so the notion that you only get seen every six weeks or every six months is not a function of your disease as much as it is a function of the healthcare system that's trying to manage it. And so there's nothing magic about seeing you every six weeks or every three months. It's just because that's the way my scheduling system works. And so if we thought about patient-centered health care, we would understand that scheduling needs to occur when your disease is changing or when you need to be seen, not when I next have an opening, but we don't do it that way. And then chronic diseases don't occur in isolation for the most part. You know, we, we, I, I remember in my training, there was one that was quite common. It was called Honda, and that was the hypertensive, obese, non-insulin dependent diabetic with asthma. And, and that, as an unfamiliar kind of shorthand, was nonetheless reflective of a constellation of ailments that occurred together. And oftentimes, treatment for one complicated the results in another. So no big surprise if you want to treat folks with beta blockers for their heart failure, but they have asthma, you're making them worse, not better. And those complexities aren't really reflected in the way we get therapies approved in this country. Oftentimes, when you go to get a drug approved, you get it approved in a patient with that one problem, not with a constellation of others. And so we leave to the reader the notion of smoothly integrating all of the potential adverse effects with all of the resonant complexities of disease to result in a, a therapy that's good for the individual. An awful lot of work for, for someone who has to see so many who are so complicated and, and a population that's only growing. And I would tell you that all the available metrics tell us that we're not doing that great a job. Let's see if I can, if I can bring a little color to that. Or could we advance my slides? Because I'm not able to. Or we could just read this one again, if you like. I'm trying to advance them. Let's see, are we jammed? Oh, there we go, okay, cool. Um, and so uh, the complexity that underlies the challenges of healthcare are only growing. And so our clinical science is moving pretty quickly. We're getting a larger and larger diagnostic and therapeutic armamentarium and the ever increasing demands of a growing population with increased access. And so we're not doing so great a job. And I would say that this is just a welcome invitation for us to do something disruptively different. Because I think even, even economists in Washington will tell you that um, if you keep doing the same thing, you will have to expect the same results. Or as Einstein said, the definition of, of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And so we need to do things disruptively different because the path we're on is really exceeds the bandwidth of our practitioners and the patients of our patients. And about those costs, um, you know, I told you that uh, we come to work every day thinking about healthcare costs. Um, th these numbers are um, difficult to get your arms around. Two point eight trillion dollars. I don't, I don't know any trillionaires, and so it's, it's, a, it's an amount of money that exceeds my comprehension. But I can tell you that in terms of percent of GDP, if I think of that in terms of percent of a household budget, you know, we are sitting at about 17.6% and we're on our way, projected and kind of agreed to by the Congressional Budget Office, we're on our, our way to numbers that exceed 25%. And so, um, you know, try to put that in perspective that um, it's not just 20% of GDP, it's 20% of every household budget is being spent on, uh, on health care. Um, and so that's, that's not something that we can afford to do. And I would tell you that um, we're looking at $750 billion of the amount of money we spend is just in waste. And so that's about a quarter of all of the money we spend in healthcare. We do so for things that don't really add value 
in terms of outcomes for individuals. Let me put that number in context. So as when you peel under that, to that total of $750 billion in waste, you get a number for $210 billion of unnecessary services and overuse. And here we are in Maryland, not far from NIH, and that number is seven times the NIH budget. And we do that every year. We prescribe things to people um, for reasons other than their best health. And so I'm guilty. You know, I've worked in an emergency room and I've taken care of, of children who are brought in with um, middle ear infections and mom really wants you know, their kid better and I really want their kid better. And the data will clearly point out that giving antibiotics doesn't make the kid better. In fact, the data is pretty clear that antibiotics for um, middle ear infections for kids actually prolongs the illness. But nonetheless, it helps to end the encounter and it's still the most common thing done for kids with middle ear infections. And we do things like that all the time. Then inefficiently delivered services. We spend $130 billion on doing things not as well as we could. And when you think about that, that's bigger than the state budget of Maryland. In fact, even if you combine all the New England states, um, we could pay for all of their state budgets with that which we lose because we're just not efficient. And then $265 billion in excess administrative costs. And so here's a frightening number. 25% of all the dollars spent in a hospital are spent on administration. When you think about how much is spent in administration and retail, it's about 2%. And so why is that? Why is it that we spend 25%? Why is it that we spend twice what every other country on the planet spends in administrative costs in hospitals? And I would tell you it's because our healthcare system has been built by accretion, but not by design. You know, we add more regulations, we look at more process metrics, we have more payers, we've, we've, we spend time managing the complexity of a system which few agree is optimal in any particular way and yet we continue to pick at it and try to make it better by adding incremental administrative burden. We're not doing ourselves a favor. And then when you think of it on a world stage, our healthcare spending is, is extraordinary. You know, we, we best by the average of the OECD nations by about twofold. And so we are clearly spending more, but we are not getting more. We are, um, to, to quote the, uh, the, the prior secretary of HHS, we are living sicker and dying quicker. And so U.S. infant mortality is 56th out of 224 listed countries, and the U.S. life expectancy is 42nd. And so it is difficult to argue that our additional spending is getting us additional value. In fact, if you threw a dart at a spinning globe, you are likely to hit a higher value healthcare system than ours if you're looking at cost per quality metric. And then this seemingly impossible set of numbers. So um, 15 years ago, the Institute of Medicine offered its report to Air as Human and suggested that by virtue of diagnostic delays, therapeutic misadventures, medication errors, and the like, that as many as 98,000 people were being expedited in their demise, were being hurried along in their death in our nation's hospitals. So when you think about it, that's 100,000 a year. That seems impossibly large. But then a recent study in the Journal of Patient Safety, the Journal of Patient Safety, points out that the actual number of deaths from errors of that ilk in hospitals is somewhere between 210 and 440,000 annually, right? So think about that for a second. Um, so, you know, we, not far from here, I was, I was working here on 9-11. Uh, I was working at the Virginia Hospital Center, and I remember sending a lot of people home so we could help to take care of people who were being brought in from the Pentagon. And I remember on that day, we lost around 3,000 people, and that was a tragedy. And that was a tragedy which has forever changed the way we travel, the way we think about security, the way we think about our own, uh, our own status as a country, how, how we should behave, and what wars should we engage in. That was 3,000 people on one day. We're looking at estimates here which appear to be on the order of 300,000, 400,000 in a year. That's, that's, you're talking about nearly 1,000 every day. And so how can that be? 
And then as an engineer, as a geeky engineer, I sit there and look at the number that says between 210 and 440,000. And perhaps, perhaps I'm more careful uh, when I think about trying to estimate something that's important as people living and dying. But we're, that, we, we have a variance there which is greater than the estimate. I mean, so, so this is a process which must not be in very tight control if it's somewhere between 200,000 and 400,000. I mean, each one of those people has a name. Each one of those people has a family. And so each one of those should be a cataclysmic event in a hospital. And yet when there are hundreds of thousands of them, we get numb to the process that in fact, oh, it's just another name the reason why someone died. And so um, that ought to be as wholly unacceptable as anything else in healthcare, and yet the drumbeat just marches on. It should have been completely unacceptable at 98,000. And whether the number is 200,000 or 400,000 or even north of that, I don't think we can know. And the fact that we can't know ought to be completely frustrating to all of us. And it's fiscally unsustainable. So I, I've tried to tell you that it's logistically unmanageable because the amount of information exceeds kind of the bandwidth and the ability of an individual to update. It exceeds the comprehension of the individual to be able to manage even their own small cluster of diseases. Um, there isn't sufficient time in the system for them to engage with the practitioners. There isn't sufficient time of the practitioners to engage with them because they're all simply overwhelmed. But I'll tell you that the, the finances here are similarly dauntingly unsustainable. So our, our current president was kind enough to point out that we get it, right? By 2025, the amount of taxes we currently pay will only be enough to finance our health care programs, Social Security, and the interest we owe in the debt. That's it. And so if you're interested in education, if you're interested in national security, if you're interested in transportation, if you think our roads and highways need repair, we're going to be borrowing money from our children and our grandchildren to pay for those things. When in fact, we're really borrowing money for our healthcare system because that's what's displacing all these other legitimate functions. And so um, we need to engage. We need to engage not just for the health of ourselves, but for the health of our healthcare system because our healthcare system is busy killing our country in the sense of its economic burden. And so, um, you know, I, I won't stand up here and say, oh, and we've got all the answers. Just listen to me. No, um, that, that isn't the case. But here's what we do believe. We do believe that our healthcare system needs to, to really benefit from the same sort of revolution that has taken place in many other commercial sectors. That notion of becoming more automated, more connected, more coordinated, and more transparent in a way that can enable smart and effective patient engagement, but also smart and effective healthcare. And so um, it, it's no surprise to you that banking has been completely changed, right? You get it. So for those of you who use mint.com or the new level money or just do mobile banking, you know, I, I bought my house in San Diego using my iPhone. I signed all my documents on my iPhone. I didn't have to sit in, with, in, in some crazy office downtown. No, 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 it was all completely doable using our, our mobile technology. And believe me, buying a house in San Diego is the single biggest commitment I think an individual should ever make because of the real estate values. So we have completely fixed banking. And then retail, America loves to shop, right? And so you can remember running into malls and running into people and running into cars in the parking lot when we were all busy shopping in big box stores and running around like crazy. And then somebody went, oh, you know, there's this cool thing you can do where you don't have to do that anymore. And, you know, my kids have Amazon Prime and have stuff delivered to them that I don't even know they bought. Um, and so retail has been remarkably changed and forever. And so it, it isn't this complex gamish and, you know, it, even to the point of talking about shopping malls may be a dying breed. And wouldn't that be great? And then let's think about the other things that connected and coordinated has created, right? So it, it looks like Facebook prompted the Arab Spring. We overthrew despotic dictators in other countries using the miracle of wireless communication for coordination and communication. 
for transmission of information. We've, we have liberated countries with information flow. And so is it too much to ask that we use the technology that has revolutionized every other aspect of our lives and even the way we're governed? Is it too much to imagine that we could use that same sort of technological approach and revolutionize healthcare? I, I, don't, I don't think so. And so I'll tell a story about Anna McAllister Slip. And Anna's a, a wonderful patient advocate, uh, champion of engagement and also technology, and kind of one of those one of those few that's willing to get up and tell her story in front of of audiences. Um, so uh, I've gotten the pleasure of knowing Anna for some time. She is a brittle type one diabetic, and very very smart, very in tune with her disease, and uses four different devices to kind of keep track of where she is with her single disease. I'll just point that out. Single, not, not a friendly disease, but only, only one. And so her life is really living a complex, continuous, and dangerous running algorithm. She's managing her, her insulin, which is a drug which, are, which is a relatively low safety to therapeutic benefit. It's a scary drug for, for those of you who, who take it, but she manages it because she's really smart and really engaged and is willing to, to integrate up information from a variety of different devices. Um, but this, doesn't, this isn't great for her because it occupies almost all of her life in managing this one chronic disease. Um, she's quick to point out that these devices don't share information between them, so she is the master integrator. She's also quick to point out that even though she gets her, her care at one of the best hospitals in America, that there's no way that the information from those devices manages to find its way to her doctor or to her electronic medical record. She's the, the sole central integrator of this single disease. Now, imagine that Anna is 30 years older and she has four more diseases and try to figure out if that system can still work for her. And I'll, I'll tell you that it really can't. And so perhaps we can move on. Perhaps we can take the gifted gadgets that the consumer industry is, um, is quite fond at foisting on us to manage our activity uh, and perhaps um, our calories and keep track of a couple things about us. And perhaps we can bend those toward the use of real chronic diseases, of real important, impactful diseases that burden so many. And perhaps we can integrate that with our homes. And perhaps we can instrument our, our homes so that um, it's possible to know when you wake up in the morning how you're doing. You don't have to ask yourself, but perhaps it's possible that the little gadget under your bed kept track of how you were sleeping. And perhaps it's possible that the, it integrates up with all of your activity monitors to know that you're, you're doing pretty well, or perhaps you're not. Or perhaps it integrates with you know, the, your bathroom mirror that is pointing out that that mole on your cheek is getting a little bit bigger. You know, perhaps it's possible that the little sensors that we can now put on you, put near you, put in your home, can all integrate smoothly to give you a better sense of how you're doing. And perhaps they can look in on your medicine chest to see if whether or not you're taking your medicine. And perhaps even alert your pharmacy that you're running low on something. And have Amazon ship you those medicines that you're about ready to run out of. Perhaps we can get to a point where there's this notion of seamless and actively and even passively engaging patients in real time, on their own terms, in their own homes. Instead of thinking that the way to manage chronic disease is episodic visits to cathedrals of care. I mean, we, you, you have chronic diseases all the time. And the notion that you're going to offload them to some remote site at some remote time is flawed. It has to happen where you are, and it has to happen all the time. And we have not constructed a healthcare system to do that. We've constructed a healthcare system that's really good at rescue, and what we need is continuous iterative care. We need liquid data, fully interoperable architectures, so that data moves wherever it's needed. The craziness that little bits of information about you are stored in places which are completely closed. And, you know, I experienced this last week. I wanted to go have a chest film because I thought I might have pneumonia. And the notion that we're going to ask me my medical history one more time, are you kidding? You know, why should we do that? 
Um, why isn't all of that information so seamlessly and smoothly available? Because after all, it's our health we're talking about. Why should we waste my time or my physician's time or his, his staff time in one more time recounting all of the things that should be well known to all of us? And so there is a term on there, uh, you know, the, the notion of if we do this right, we can lower the cost of thinking about healthcare, which is something we desperately need to do. And um, I, I used to work uh, at a leadership job in a medical device company, and we were making really, really complicated implantable pacemakers and defibrillators that readily overwhelmed our doctors, right? So, so you know, geeky electrophysiologists like me would still be overwhelmed by the millions of different possible parameters that you can program these very smart devices. And so our marketing guys said, you know what? We're embarrassing the even the best physicians with our technology. Let's stop doing that. And let's let's make it so that these things automatically populate the parameters that address the patient. And we called that easeability. So I'm never one much on neologisms. I'm not sure what we're trying to transmit, but I do like that notion of ease and ability together because we desperately need that. And that's my last neologism in this talk. Um, it's not just about at home though, this notion of smooth information flow. It can't just be in the house because that's not where, at least at the moment, where healthcare happens. It, the reality of an intensive care unit today is there are at least 10, often a dozen devices that surround a critically ill patient. And just as we would like care coordination to happen among the docs who take care of us, just as an aside, you know, in 1970, the average number of docs involved in a patient's care was two when they went to the hospital. Today, it's more than 15. And so the, the you know, you, you hear people, the hue and cry that my, my care is so fractionated, no, none of my doctors are talking to each other. That's true. Um, that's an unfortunate reality that care coordination is an aspiration, but it's not a reality. But we ought to make it a reality when we talk about the devices, because e these devices do not have egos. You know, they, they can, in fact, share information as long as they're told to, and yet they don't. And so, crazily enough, the device that's measuring your blood pressure doesn't talk to the pump that's giving you medicine that controls your blood pressure. So imagine that. That's like driving down the road and you've got your foot on the gas pedal, but you can't see the speedometer and you can't see the other cars around you. You wouldn't drive that way, and yet healthcare drives that way. We routinely, where there's an opportunity for feedback, we routinely open up the loop, and we don't allow the information relevant to the outcome to be filtered back to the effector. And how can that be? Instead, we ask the critical care nurse at the bedside to smoothly integrate up all that information. And I don't know if you visited an intensive care unit lately, but when you see those ICU nurses, they've typically got lots of little numbers scribbled on the edges of their scrubs. And is that what we want for the way information is going to travel in healthcare? I certainly hope not. It's not, it's not what, I, what I want, and it's not what I think we all deserve. And so I think this, this lack of interoperability, and I say interoperability easily because I've studied it, but it's an eight-syllable word. And so I appreciate it's not going to flow off of all of your tongues. But this notion of seamless liquid flow of information to where it's needed is essential. It, it underscores the, all of the needless repetition, all of the loss, all, all of the hazard, not all of the hazard, but much of the hazard in healthcare, because that information has to flow together in a way that it can be integrated and then used. And so we, we talk about patient engagement as a way of unleashing, you know, the gifted gadgets to, and the other innovations we have to create a smart system. But the missing element, I think, is the notion that there has to be this sort of functional, for the engineers call it semantic interoperability. Information has to flow in a way that we understand what it is, wherever it is. And so we've stood up an independent organization. We've been championing this idea for a couple of years. We've been working with the FDA, with ONC. And I think everyone gets it that we need to do this. Um, there are business reasons why this isn't happening, not, not technical reasons. But we've stood up a, an independent organization called the Center for Medical Interoperability and are putting hospital system CEOs on the board with the notion that they're going to require the vendors to provide interoperable gadgets or they're simply not going to buy them anymore 
We're not going to have a Tower of Babel in hospitals where you've got, you know, gazillions of devices, none of which share anything with any of the others. That's just not, it's not good. It's not what we need. And it's interesting that today, September 30th, it's an interesting day because in 1980 on September 30th, uh, that was kind of the beginning of the Ethernet. And for those of you who can remember that term ether or ethernet, you know, that communication that occurs kind of spontaneously in local area networks between machines. We do this all over America. You know, I doubt, I suspect that in your hospital or in your home, you have a wireless network and that when you're there, your little laptop, you can print to your printer. I suspect that all that works. And yet when you go to a hospital, the notion that your blood pressure cuff is stuck into the pump or your glucometer is stuck into your insulin, um, none of that's happening. And so the internet, which has changed everything, has just not yet changed healthcare. And that's a bit of a problem. And I'll tell you, I, my, my, I, I speak a little bit, and one of my taglines is we have to move faster because patients are waiting. I'll tell you, I don't think patients are waiting anymore. <laughs> So um, this is a great story. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, about a program called Night Scout. And this is, imagine frustrated, technically sophisticated parents of kids with diabetes said, you know what? There's a really cool glucometer that Dexcom makes and the kids can wear it for seven or 10 days in a row and it keeps track of their glucose, but I can't get the information out of it in a way that I want. I want that information all the time. And so they figured out how to hack into it. And then they made a software developer's kit and put it on the internet so that other parents could hack into their kids' glucometers. And so you've got, at last count, more than 4,000 users who have figured out that, you know what? I can make interoperability happen for my kid with the ultimate result being that the parents are now letting their kids play with their, grand ki their grandparents because they can now look in on how they're doing even when they're not in front of them. They can feel more comfortable when their kids are at school because they can look in on information and don't have to rely on the school nurse to do so. And so, you know, it used to be the, the case that we all had to do this for people, but you know what? People are taking control of this. The average person is figuring out that interoperability of information around their healthcare is their right and it's their responsibility as well. And so some are taking up the challenge. And so um, I think this is a terrific and exciting uh, story and it speaks to uh, perhaps when the vendor community goes too slow and the regulatory environment isn't quite ready, um, maybe it leaks out from under that control and finds its way to those folks who really need an answer. And I also think there's an opportunity for us not to just to directly engage in the movement of, of information about our health, but also to in directly engage in the cost of our health care. Um, we think that um, you know, it's, it's imperative that patients get involved uh, in um, in the cost of their own health care. And it's pretty clear that with the rise of um, high deductible health plans, the enhanced ethical responsibility that physicians now have by um, having a mandate to practice parsimonious care, uh, that there's a mandate for us all to understand the price of what we're getting when we're getting it. I think, you know, we've all, we've all experienced the lunacy of um, getting your health care only to be told six months later what it's really going to cost you. You wouldn't, you wouldn't shop for anything else in your life that way. And this is shopping for the things that can determine your life. And so why is that acceptable? And in, in particular, it, it's not. Um, and so we feel pretty passionate about that. We've, we've worked up, uh, tried to get an understanding for how this, is, this happens. I think burdening the patient with all of the responsibility for negotiating the prices of their health care is probably not going to work. But one, one area that we like um, that, that perhaps hasn't been explored is prompting the physicians to understand the financial implications of their orders as they try to take care of folks. Because for right now, when I ask my colleagues, hey, how do you, how do you talk to patients about the cost of their health care? They say, oh, we don't. God, that's really complicated. Everybody's got a different plan and everybody's got a different place on their deductible. And oh my God, that's, you know, phew, that's tough, you know? And so I get it. I get it that it's tough, but it's not impossible. In fact, I was talking to the folks at United Healthcare last week and said, so is it possible to find out at the moment I'm about to order a test what the patient's out-of-pocket responsibility is? He goes, oh yeah, that's transaction 270 or 271. You can just send that in and we get it right back to you real time. We do real-time price adjudication. 
So I'm like, well, then why aren't we doing that? You know, so, so is that possible to do? We think it is possible to do. And so we're going to run a study to see when you give providers information about the economic burden that their choice has on individuals at that moment, do you make a choice in favor of their economic welfare? Because we all promise to first do no harm, and maybe we can include do no financial harm as part of that rubric of doing no harm. Because after all, more than half of all bankruptcies in the United States are downstream of medical expenses. And it's not just up to the docs and the patients, it's also up to policymakers. And so for those of you following this notion of all payer claims databases, the notion that every adjudicated price for anything in healthcare ought to be compiled in a national database so that, um, or, or statewide databases, so that smart, young 20-somethings can figure out cute apps for helping you figure out where to get bargains in healthcare. We're supporting that. We, we think that's a great idea to have there be in every state all pay all payer claims databases so that um, there is no hiding the ball when it comes to how much people are charging and paying for healthcare services. And so I'm going to come to the end of my time. I think um, it's important that we engage in healthcare, not just to save our own lives, but also to save our healthcare system, because it's as beleaguered as each of you are as individuals. It is as stressed, it is as overwhelmed, uh, and it needs your help. Um, we are not the smartest people on the planet at West. You know, I've, what I've routinely said is, uh, no matter where you work, most smart people work somewhere else. Uh, and I think, I think that's, that's axiomatically true. And so as you think about this and as the, you know, the big ship moves forward, if you've got really good ideas, uh, let us know. Um, you know, we're blessed. I'll say uh, Gary and Mary West who fund us, two wonderful Midwest successful entrepreneurs um, who have um, each, each are billionaires in their own right and they have neither children nor vices. And so they took a look around and said, you know what, we live the great American dream and the cost of healthcare is keeping others from doing the same. So let's address that. So I'm, I'm delighted to be able to work uh, for those folks. I would say Isaac Asimov gave us a watchword here. He said, it is change, inevitable change, that is the dominant factor in society today. No sensible decision can be made any longer without taking into account not only the world as it is, but the world as it will be. And healthcare will be very, very different than what it is now because it simply has to be. Um, the Greeks had two words for time. One was chronos, the typical passage of time. And the other was keros, a time of supreme relevance. And so I think we're at that, that moment of supreme relevance for our healthcare system because it simply can't go on the way it is. We have persistent economic challenges and the frank financial unsustainability of our healthcare system. We have threateningly unfavorable demographics. We are all getting older and in the process accumulating all those chronic diseases that cost us so much. We have a, a model for healthcare delivery which is unsustainable, even if we had enough docs and nurses, which we don't. And then we have unprecedented increased access by virtue of recent political gains. And as I would often say, patients are waiting, but I guess the truth is they're not. <laughs> so um, thanks for having me here in front of you today. Uh, I think this is a great, a great meeting and a great effort. Thanks to the sponsors for getting us all together. I think I have a couple minutes for questions if there are any. Um, thanks for your time. Brave souls with questions? Talk to each other? No, no. Um, the, the, there's a, there's an opportunity when you build um, how how devices work to to choose to have them pay attention to international standards where communication can smoothly occur, or to build proprietary communication networks. And so when when you do so, when you build proprietary networks, then it's easier for you to sell your next product into that hospital. It's a strategy of land and expand. And similarly, when you use open standards, you facilitate your competition. You, know, you facilitate innovation by anyone as opposed to using proprietary standards. And so we see this particularly in the EMR space where um, you know, the, the notion that EMRs smoothly share information doesn't so much happen um, and instead each have 
elements of proprietary communication structures which preclude that relative easy sharing. And so I don't want to make too much of that. I think technically it's completely possible. We just we just haven't perhaps used the power of the pen when signing the check when we're buying equipment in hospitals to insist that those inf those individual vendors work to common open standards so that everything can in fact communicate. Please. Hi, you were talking about apps, and here I have this brilliant idea for an app very similar to what you're speaking of, but I'm this little tadpole in the giant ocean of sharks. So if I was to link in with you and write to you my idea, would you connect me with the proper people to help this become a reality? Certainly try. Certainly awesome. try. That's wonderful. Um, so you had said just kind of offhand comment about healthcare not happening in the home, help happening in hospitals, and I was tweeting with my friend who is a mom of a child with cystic fibrosis, and she says that they take seven, 700 pills per month from home, 24 hours per week of treatments for home. Um, they don't really get health care in the hospital. They're given advice on how to, how to maintain that at home. They do IV medication around the clocks and weekly weights, calorie counts. They administer um, chest um, physical therapy, and that all happens at home. I think there, are, there are, certainly are examples where we're making inroads and in managing important chronic diseases at home. Um, and so I don't, I don't mean to say that as much as a, a, a generalization, but when we look at the you know, tens of millions of Americans who are struggling with um, the chronic illnesses of diabetes, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, congestive heart failure, the bulk of that care is intermittent rescue as opposed to continuous and, and iterative care. And so cystic fibrosis is one good example. I think there are, there are several good examples where we are effective at making sure that care happens uh, in the home as much as possible. But for the overwhelming bulk of, of what we do in chronic disease and where we spend money, it's in emergency rooms and doctors' hospitals and procedure rooms. Hi, uh, I'm a small town family doc and you talked a lot about the need for me to be more available for my patients when they're in times of change and how this information that we can generate at home will help with that. Um, my concern is this deluge of information that will be pushed towards me. I don't need another fax, medicine being the last uh, bastion of the fax machine, and uh, nor do I need another portal to go out to. And the challenge that I see is how do we filter this data so that it's meaningful data getting to me not only sort of in a, a Toyota lean concept of you know right at the point of care, but also so that I know in advance when that change is happening and can get my patient in. Um, the products that are being developed at times scare me. I don't know if anybody's seen the Owlet Socklet, where you can watch your child's uh, pulse ox, heart rate, and if they roll over at night, so you can be a better parent. And then you can print out, their ad you know, of this high tech thing says print out three weeks worth of information and take it to your pediatrician. The last thing I need is to reassure a mother that at 3 a.m. when the pulse ox dropped to 92% for five seconds, that their baby was okay. Yeah. There's a whole lot more benefit of my time. So how do we think about uh, that? It's, it's, such a, it's such a great point, and thank you so much for, for making it. Um, I'll, I'll give you a little vignette. When uh, I was the chief medical officer at Guidant, we, uh, we, we, I rolled out to our medical advisory board that we were going to make all the pacemakers and all the defibrillators smart. And so that if anything happened to them, or if there was any change in their patient, there would be an immediate email to them that would say what was going on. And they looked at me and they said, wow, that is so neat that you can do that. And if you do that, I will immediately use everyone else's products but yours. And so, you, you know, the, the point you're making is exactly the point they were making is that do not give me information that I'm not prepared to take. Do not send me all sorts of unfiltered, unexamined data. Don't, I, I don't want the data. I don't want the information. I want an unassailable cue for action when it's essential. But up and until then, please don't do that. And so that's where we have to get to the notion of integrated information, smart and learning systems that kind of decrease the cost of our thinking. Because, you know, and, and 
as I, as I uh, help us to figure out how to make some investment decisions, the number of innovators who come and say, I've got this cool thing, I stick it on a patient and it sends streaming data to their doctor. Uh, and the doctors cringe when they hear that. And so it is about intermediary systems that merge all of that information and help to make intelligent inferences and then ultimately unassailable cues for action as opposed to simply streams of data because you've got no time for it and there's no value in it. I uh, really enjoyed your presentation. My name is John Phelan. I'm the CEO and founder of Zwina at ZwinaHealth.com. Um, I'm interested in your opinion about meaningful use and specifically meaningful use too, where we have a very interesting metric around consumer engagement. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think uh, I think here with us today uh, will be uh, uh, Farzad Mastashari, who you know uh, used to run uh, ONC, and so I I will leave much of that question unanswered. I would say that um, meaningful use in general of the you know, widely distributed EMRs really only comes to full fruition when all of that information is available wherever it's needed in a format which is liquid and semantically interoperable, and we are not yet there. Okay, so uh, I've chewed up all of my time. Thank you so much for having me here today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage our open data sponsor, George Machini, CEO of Catavault. Good morning. That was a, a great session and a, a good lead into our topic. I'm George Machini, CEO of Catavault. Catavault's a mobile platform that helps uh, companies break silos. And as Dr. Joe talked about, uh, the data that's being collected is, is heavily fragmented and that fragmentation is growing as uh, more people touch patients and our, as our patient population grows. So this panel is gonna focus on who's really looking at that information. As a society, we've become really good at collecting information. And we just heard about uh, these streams that come from patients and all the different ways to collect that information. And uh, it can be overwhelming and it could be uh, irrelevant, but when it's relevant and when it's in context, it could be very powerful. So today we're gonna to discuss um, some innovative ways that companies are making uh, this information actionable. And uh, to help us in that discussion, we have uh, Dr. Samesh Nagam, who's the CIO at Independence Blue Cross.